Hi class, time for some more chemistry. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture chunk covering the material for class three. Uh, it's mostly covering chapter two, atoms and elements. Uh, what we'll be covering in these, these three lecture chunks, uh, understanding the consequence of the laws of conservation of mass and the law of multiple proportions uh, and the law of definite proportions, also distinguishing elements, ions, and isotopes based on numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons. This should be pretty simple. Uh, you'll have seen it before. Uh, calculating the relative abundance and atomic weights for elements and determining the, uh, the molecular mass of a, a molecule using isotopic masses and abundances. Um, what we're not going to cover in these, these lecture chunks and any of the lecture chunks today, we won't cover the history of atomic theory. It's really uh, amazing that it's only 200 years old. It's only about since 200 years since people really uh, started to understand how things are, uh, how all this different variety of, of chemical behavior we get can be explained in terms of atoms and molecules. Um, it's 200 years old, but people weren't really convinced of it until about 100 years later, until Brownian motion was understood and, and it was used to demonstrate the reality of molecules. So it's, it's really something that the, the basic ideas are 200 years old, but it was really only widely accepted for maybe 100, 120. Um, we won't cover the history of the discovery of the electron, although one thing I would say, um, history is always more complicated than in, you know, you're in beginning level textbooks. Um, here's a couple of links about the history of the Millikan oil drop experiment. Even on Wikipedia, there's a lot of information if you want some more readings. There was actually a graduate student, uh, um, Harvey Fletcher, who was intimately involved in a lot of the initial development and built the first prototype. Um, but did not appear on the paper and was not recognized in the Nobel Prize. And there's some very interesting history there um, about all of all of this process. So I would uh, there should be in, when I post this PDF online, those links should be active, so you should be able to follow them up. So it's always very interesting to see how some of these ideas were created. Once the ideas are created, I mean they seem very simple and and self uh, you know sort of self obvious. Uh, but the history of how they came about is very much a human endeavor. So I would recommend you know, some of those readings and, and uh, digging a little bit more into the theory, um, the history of the theory. Uh, we won't really talk about patterns in the periodic table. They're mentioned here, but we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about atomic structure and quantum mechanics. So we'll talk about the, the, uh, the periodic trends in the context of the um, why those trends appear. Okay. So the law of definite proportions is uh, just a statement that all compounds, no matter how they're produced, they have the exact same ratios of masses and therefore, um, by, by logic eventually, by atoms. For example, uh, water, uh, before they even knew anything about what a water molecule looked like, it was always 11.19% hydrogen and 18.81% oxygen. Before doing like careful measurements with combustion and breaking things apart, you know, that's not immediately obvious. One could imagine that, uh, you know, before understanding this, you could think that, oh, you know, this water, per, you know, this water co that comes from the mountain spring is, is better and has a, a little bit different composition. It's a fundamentally different type of water than the water you get from the ocean. Uh, we know now, no, it's the exact same water. It just has different things mixed in it. Uh, but the, the building blocks are exactly the same. Um, so Dalton correctly surmised that the compounds must be made of small numbers of atoms and a fixed arrangement from this and from also the law of multiple proportions that elements can combine in different ways to form different substances whose mass ratios are small whole number multiples of each other. After you study enough compounds, you discover that the mass ratios are, um, are actually uh, constant multiples uh, and that those multiples are essentially multiples of single units. Uh, that allows you to figure out that things like a nitric oxide, NO, um, is one thing that forms, and then nitrous oxide actually has exactly twice as much oxygen. You can't tell that from a, you know, a single set of compounds, but if you look at several different compounds that contain the same elements, you can calculate these ratios and from that start inferring what the mass of each uh, atom is. So from these, uh, you construct the logic that really there are only uh, that all the, all the compounds are made of these small numbers of elements. And if they have these small ratios, really the only thing that makes sense is uh, they are, uh, rather than being thousand, you know, uh, you know nitric oxide, 1,000 nitrogen and one, what, nitrogen and 1,000 oxygen, it's really just one nitrogen and one oxygen. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, this surmise the compounds must be made of small numbers of atoms in a fixed arrangement. 
So uh, another important conservation law is the law of conservation of mass, that mass is neither created or destroyed in chemical reactions. So if we, um, so let's, for example, take an, ex uh, an aqueous solution. An aqueous solution of mercury nitrate and potassium iodide will react to form a precipitate of mercury iodide and aqueous potassium nitrate. So if we have, um, say, 3.25 grams of mercury nitrate and 3.32 grams of potassium iodide, and those react, and if those react completely and we're very careful and we don't lose anything on the side of the beaker, then we will get 4.55 grams of mercury iodide and 2.02 uh, .02 grams of potassium nitrate to add up to 6.57 grams. So in these chemical reactions, we are not destroying mass. The mass stays the same, which is really nice. Whenever you have this sort of constraint, you've got an equation that you can use in solving problems. Um, atoms are usually conserved in non-nuclear reactions, which again, I don't think we're going to quite get to the chapter on, on, on the nuclear chemistry. Uh, but in every, you know, every, so everything we're going to study in this class, uh, then the number of atoms of each type is conserved in a reaction. Again, we have our, uh, the same solutions mixed together. And at the beginning, we've got one atom of uh, mercury, two of nitrogen, two of potassium, two of iodide and six of oxygen, and we end up with uh, one mercury, two nitrogen, two potassium, two, iod uh, two iodine uh, atoms, and six oxygen. Uh, all we're doing in chemical reactions is moving these around. I mean, that may be obvious, but it's important to think of the mathematical consequences. You've got another set of constraints that every single set of atoms you have, whatever the atoms you had before is equal to the atoms after. And that mathematical relationship provides uh, mathematical constraints that allow you to solve a lot of these uh, chemical equation balancing uh, problems.